Hello and welcome back to All About Russia. My name is Andrew and in this video we're going to be looking at one of the strangest federal subjects of the Russian Federation, the Jewish Autonomous Oblast. The Jewish Autonomous Oblast is located in the far east of Russia, in the far eastern federal district and in the far eastern economic region. It is the 61st largest federal subject at just under 14,000 square miles in size making it larger than the country of Taiwan. It is the only remaining autonomous oblast within the Russian Federation, for reasons we will discuss later in this video. It ranks 82nd out of 85 federal subjects by population, at a mere 150,000 residents, a figure higher than the nation of Grenada. Interestingly, it is one of only two places in the world that has Jewish jurisdiction. The other, of course, being Israel. The Jewish Autonomous Oblast is neighboured by the Amur Oblast to the north, by the Habarovskrai to the east, and by the country of China to the south. Just under half of the oblast is forested, with around 3% being under plough. The Autonomous Oblast is very mountainous, with mountains dominating from both the north and the east, with around 40% of all terrain in the oblast. The highest mountain in the oblast is Mount Student at over 1,400 meters tall. Curiously, this strange name actually came about because it did not have a registered official name, and thus this name was decided on in a poll in 2006 of competing schools in the region. The longest river in the region is the Amur River, of which over 350 miles flows through this region. It also serves as the southern boundary with China. This name comes from Tungustic languages and likely means simply water, though you can find a little more about the Amur and other rivers in Russia by checking out this video over here. The Jewish Autonomous Oblast only has five administrative regions due to it being so small, with the capital, Berbizhan, being its own administrative district. The Autonomous Oblast does have an anthem which is playing now and will be playing throughout the remainder of this section. The flag of the Jewish Autonomous Oblast is a white rectangle with a seven coloured rainbow going across it. The seven colours are to represent the several candles of a Jewish menorah and thus the Jewish heritage of the region. The white background is said to represent peace and this flag was adopted on the 27th of October 1997. Interestingly, this flag almost fell foul of Russia's anti-homosexuality laws because it is a rainbow. In a cunning legal argument, however, the region argued that their rainbow was nothing like that used by the gay community because it has a light blue colour. Yes, that is the defence. This flag has been legal to fly in Russia henceforth, and this has been used in more than one protest to circumvent Russia's anti-homosexuality laws. Humans have settled in the region since at least 6000 BC, with evidence being found near the village of Kogoleva. These were a hunter-gathering society using stone weapons, with later evidence suggesting bronze reaching the region around 2000 BC and iron by 600 BC. Who these people exactly were, we do not know, and it may well have covered different peoples at different epochs in time. Our first written records come from the 5th century, from the Chinese. Their annals record the Moje as living in the area farming along the banks of the Amur River. The Moje are a very curious people, as very little is actually known about them. They are considered by some to be the progenitors of the Yurchin people who would later inhabit the area. The Moje residing here were eventually drawn into the wider geopolitical spheres where, in the 7th century, the region was invaded and annexed by the Bahay Kingdom. The Bahay Kingdom was a Korean Chinese dynasty and their control put the modern Jewish Autonomous Oblast on the fringes of their empire. Being on the fringes of their empire meant that Korean culture did not seminate it deeply unlike in the rest of their kingdom. And by the time of the Liao Empire, which invaded from the north in the 10th century, the region was populated by Yurchin clans. The Yurchin clans in what is now the Jewish Autonomous Oblast operated independently, and this posed a danger to the Liao Kingdom. By 936 AD, the Liao dynasty had subdued the last Yurchin tribe from the area, imposing a position of overlordship. The Yurchin tribes at this time did not see themselves as one people, 
nor did they have one unifying leader. Each clan, each tribe, had a different relationship with the state, whereas the Liao dynasty did not see it in these terms. In the mind of the Liao kingdom, the urchin were their vassals and had a duty to not intrigue with other states. So when some urchin tribes made overtures to the Song dynasty further south, and the Goryeo kingdom to the east, with whom the Lao regularly fought, this threw the Yurchin Lao relationship into troubled waters. The Khitan leader of the Lao Empire, a proto Mongolic people, began to view all Yurchins less as an asset and more as a fifth column. This led to a further demand of resources, manpower, and tribute put upon the Yurchin tribes in an attempt to take away the danger. This worked just about as well as you might expect. In 1114, due to aggressive taxation and abuses by the Khitan overlords, the Yurchin rebelled, gathering around Chief Wuganai of the Wanyang clan to the south, who upon overthrowing the Khitan took the title of Taizu, ousted the Khitans and created the Jin dynasty, which ruled over much of northern China and what would become the Russian Far East. The land of the Jewish autonomous oblast would remain on the fringes of this empire as well home to the wild Yurchins, those uncivilized by Chinese standards. Sinicization was a common occurrence for many of the early peoples who ruled over parts of what we now call China, often beginning with leaders adopting Chinese techniques and methods of rule and eventually devolving into cultural and spiritual semblance. This is actually one of the factors that many historians point to in the fall of the Jin a century later. In 1211, the Mongols poured across the Jin lands. At the head, Genghis Khan himself. The lands of the Jewish Autonomous Oblast quickly fell under Mongolian control, the few Yurchin tribes residing there bending the knee before the Mongol onslaught. As a result, the land was considered Mongolian right up until the fall of the Yuan dynasty in the 15th century. What is notable is that this region, lightly populated by Yurchins during Mongol rule, began to be infused with other Tungustic ethnic groups, seeking out an existence along the Amir River, the Nanai, the Nagidals, and the Aveng. This is unlikely to have been a planned resettlement. It is more likely to simply be people being dislodged from elsewhere, settling where they were able to. In either case, this benefited the Mongolian Empire, providing both manpower and taxation to the region. The fall of the Yuan began in 1387, with the defeat of their forces by the ascendant Chinese Ming Empire. As Mongolian power waned, the wild Yurchin and Tungustic peoples of the Jewish Autonomous Oblast began to assert their own liberty. Interestingly, the Ming set up a military commission in 1409 at Nurgen, near the Amur River, to deal with these nomadic Yurchin tribes. This was a very clever policy, as it allowed the Chinese Ming Empire to both create friendly buffer states as well as keep tabs on what was going on on the other side of the river. Sadly, this policy only lasted for 26 years, and the military commission was withdrawn, a reflection on wider Chinese inwardness being promoted at this time. And so, for a time, the people who lived in the region that would one day become the Jewish Autonomous Oblast lived free of foreign influence, if only for a short while. In the late 16th century, the Yurchin tribes, free from both Mongolian and Chinese influence, began to unify in a series of inter-tribal wars. In 1611, the wild Yurchin of the Jewish Autonomous Oblast were defeated by the rising Yurchin kingdom of Jin. Whilst this continuation of the name may have been heralding to their past, it's interesting to note that despite defeating the wild Yurchins, they were not included into this empire. There are a couple of theories as to why this might have been. Firstly, despite not being ruled by the Chinese, the Yurchin tribes to the south were heavily influenced by them and may have seen their northern cousins as too difficult and dangerous to integrate successfully. Another theory holds that the Amur, being a vast river, acted as a useful barrier against incursions and thus there was no real reason to cross it. For whatever reason, the Yurchins living in what would one day become the Jewish Autonomous Oblast were left out of this rising kingdom. And in 1616, the Kingdom of Jin was born. History would know these Yurchin tribes by a slightly different name, the Manchu. 16 years later, they would invade China 
and create the last dynasty to rule the Celestial Empire. Russia finally enters this story in 1642, in the form of an expedition under Erofi Khabarov, Cossack leader and future founder of Khabarovsk. The Cossacks were exploring the Amur Basin, partly for furs, partly to support colonies established elsewhere, and encountered wild urchins as well as Dorian, or Mongolian, people living along its banks. Khabarov was suitably impressed with the region, noting its good farming conditions and citing it as a possible future area of settlement. Seven years later, this was realised, with Cossack settlers under Stepanov Onufri building the first Russian settlement in the region, the Kosogori Ostrog. This region was included in the Albazinsky Voivodeship, a short-lived Russian exclave on the borders of the Chinese Empire. The reason it was short-lived is precisely because it was on the borders of the Chinese Empire. Not taking kindly to foreign powers resting on their borders, the Chinese marched an army to dismantle the Russian garrisons. After marching an army to dismantle the Russian garrisons, in 1698 the Treaty of Nurchinsk expelled the Russians from the region, citing the entire Jewish Autonomous Oblast area as under Qing control. Curiously, despite there being no accounts of raiding into the Qing Empire, the Chinese state made a point of depopulating their border region, forcing Yurchin, Avenk, Nigan, Mongols and Negadals all to flee to the north, east and west. This drastic action was a reflection of what was going on elsewhere in China at this moment in time. The Qing had been at war with the Mongolian Zungars to the northwest since 1687, and suppressing Ming reactionaries since their own war in China had begun. This made the Manchu very paranoid about any regional force growing in strength, and as such, acted decisively in pre-emptive measures. These measures were put in place for the security of the empire, though as we would see, their effects would be fatal to it. Throughout the 1700s, Russian explorers were seeking a warm water port, the Arctic tundra of Siberia having proven less than fruitful in this regard. Sporadically throughout the 18th century, explorers would report back on the empty and abandoned settlements along the Amur River near the Chinese border. So too did they mention the plentiful wheat, rice and grains that grew wild in this region, likely able to support communities established further north. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, they reported a lack of guards, or of any significant Chinese presence. In 1845, a Baltic German, Alexander von Middendorf, wrote a glowing report to his superiors that the Amur Valley was fertile, vacant, and open to Russian expansion. This report influenced his superior, Governor General of East Siberia, Nikolai Muravyov, to perform his own reconnaissance into the region. In addition to the abandoned garrisons and wild rice growing in the region, they found something that was perhaps even more valuable, something crucial to the Russian Empire, a warm water port. In 1855, partly to test the Chinese and partly to show up the region against British interests, who at this point were shelling ports not so far away in the Crimean War, Transbaikal Cossacks were instructed to enter the Amur region and began to build settlements. Before, in the mid-17th century, when the Russian state had done this, entire armies had been sent from China to expel them from the region. Now, only words. This was because the Chinese had much, much bigger problems on their hands, namely the Taiping Rebellion to the south and looming British invasion in the east. This latter threat became a reality in the form of the Second Opium War and provided a great opportunity for Russia to lean harder on the Chinese. Seeing the beleaguered Chinese struggling to stave off internal rebellion and foreign invasion, Moraviov threatened war if the Chinese did not cede empty land. In the Treaty of Aigun, the lands that would become the Jewish Autonomous Oblast were ceded to Russia, along with a huge amount of territory, over 230,000 square miles. In December, this was formalized as the Amur Oblast, and the Cossack host, the Amur Cossacks, raised upon it. This marks the single biggest period of change in the region's history. 200 years before, it had been home to about a dozen indigenous groups, some who had been there for centuries. 
Now, a flurry of Slavic, European and Eurasian settlers came in, completely changing the ethnic, religious and physical makeup of the region. New towns and villages were erected, and an entire new order of existence came to be. With the discovery of gold in the Amur, this increased dramatically and the population of the Amur blast grew substantially, including some of its first Jews. In 1884, the Amur Governor General was established and a vast swath of Siberia included in it. The improved administration of the region, as well as in front of new settlers, helped spur on development. In 1907, the Amur Railway was begun, connecting it to the Greater Siberian Railway and onward to distant Moscow. To supply this railway and the gold extraction process, huge timber yards were established across the blast, cutting down trees to build planks required to ford the marshes and rivers of the region. Curiously enough, the capital Birabijan actually finds its origins in this time, as it was originally set up as an isolated railway station called Tikhonskaya Station or Quiet Station. The history of Jews in Russia is a fascinating topic and one that we will definitely cover in a future video. However, to understand how the Jewish Autonomous Oblast came to be, we do have to look at the condition of Russian Jews in the 19th century. Jews had been in Russia a long time, dating back to the days of Kiev and Rus, and in some parts, as we saw in our Crimean video, even longer. Yet with the conquering partition of Poland, huge numbers of Jews came under the Russian crown. As Jews evermore came under the public eye in Russia, there rose a question. A question that has been asked many times in many places. What to do with the Jews? Make no mistake, 19th century Russia was incredibly anti-Semitic. Jews were widely seen as parasites to Russian society and often killed en masse in spontaneous pogroms, a Russian word that has entered the English language for its sheer brutality. Jews were forbidden to live outside their Pale of Settlement, in what is now Poland, and barred from many services and stations in Russian life. The religious nature of the Russian Sardom added an element to this persecution, where Jews were condemned as the killers of Christ. What made the Jewish question particularly tricky in Russia was that freedom of movement was pretty much unheard of. Centuries of bondage, even after the ending of serfdom in 1860, left the Jews unable to leave the country freely, trapping them in situations both precarious and volatile. Thus, when the October Revolution came and the Bolsheviks seized power, one of the first acts was to abolish the Pale of Settlement. Jews could now live outside the Pale, but for most, this was unthinkable. In a time of upheaval, war and death, would you want to leave your home? In August of 1918, a commission was established to settle the Jewish question, and several locations for a relocation were suggested. The Azovkost, Belarus and Crimea were all suggested, but ultimately rejected on ground of being too near, i.e. near where Slavs lived. Eventually, in 1927, and after several pogroms, a decision was made, the Russian Far East. During the Russian Civil War, the Russian Far East had exchanged hands several times. The land that would make up the Jewish Autonomous Oblast firstly being in the provisional government of Russia, then joining the Far Eastern Republic. We have covered the Far Eastern Republic in our video on the Amir Blast, which you can check out over here. The Far Eastern Republic was a state that existed from 1920 to 1922. Established to be a buffer between the Japanese and the Soviets, it switched between influence, ultimately joining the Soviet Union in November 1922. The plan was to resettle as many Jews as possible to a strip of land along the Amir River. This was for several reasons. Firstly, and most importantly, it removed the Jews from Europe and put them away from the Slavic nations of the Soviet Union. There was little regard for the Jews even under communist eyes, and this was deemed as much for the protection of the Jews themselves as it was for the benefit of the Slavic nations. Secondly, the Russian Far East was underpopulated and a weak spot in the Soviet Union. This had been the case during Tsarist times as well, and should the Chinese decide to invade, the Soviet Union would have struggled to defend the region. Having liquidated the Amir Cossacks after the Civil War, who had traditionally served as a buffer to any potential invasion force, a new buffer was needed, and the Jews served this purpose. 
Thirdly, as a titular nation of the Soviet Union, every race had the right to a homeland. In most instances, this was easily resolved. But in the case of stateless peoples, such as the Jews and the Roma, this became trickier. By allotting Jewish people land to call their home in the new communist utopia, the Bolsheviks fulfilled their creed and earned from international prestige. Lastly, not only was this area underpopulated, it was also underperforming economically. Whilst Gulag served as fine sources for labour and productivity, long-term production would require willing settlers, and thus the Soviet Union turned to the Jews. On the 28th of March 1928, the Birbizhan Jewish National District was raised and the first settlers sent. Around 650 Jewish settlers arrived in the marshy, mosquito-filled woodlands of their new home. Not surprisingly, faced with a minimal existence even by Soviet standards, more than half of these settlers opted to return back to a precarious life in Europe. Nonetheless, the Soviets attempted to garner interest and investment in the region, and provided global propaganda to Jews living abroad to come and live in this new Jewish utopia. As time went on, this actually became a popular alternative to British Palestine, favoured by Jews who held religious opposition to settling in Palestine, Jews who could not leave the Soviet Union, and the unfortunate. Over a thousand foreign Jews emigrated to the Jewish Autonomous Oblast, as well as 7,000 more Soviet Jews, helping to bolster the numbers and the development of the region. However, the region still had problems retaining settlers. Irregular flooding and... Sorry, I must be reading that wrong. Anthrax. You are saying they had anthrax. The black stuff that kills you. Jesus Christ. Yes, dear viewer, in addition to the brutal winters, primitive conditions, irregular flooding, they also had breakouts of anthrax that plagued the region. Out of 100,000 people living in the region, only around 16% were Jewish, mostly from Soviet nations. Nevertheless, the place to take on a Jewish character, with Yiddish language newspapers, Jewish culinary traditions, and musical performances all happening across the district. In 1934, in response to a growing interest in the Zionist movement, the district had been upgraded to an autonomous district. In 1938, with the division of the Priyamursky Krai and the allocation of the Jewish Autonomous Oblast into the Habarovs territory, the region was upgraded again into an autonomous oblast. This was probably the single positive thing for that year, as Stalin's purges were in full swing. The Sovietization of the Jews began, with an emphasis on the communist and atheist character of the nation. Not every tradition or every bit of culture was suppressed, but many of the liberties afforded to Soviet Jews in the 1920s were revoked. Synagogues were closed, Yiddish language schools scrutinised, and suspicion evoked. Many of the foreign-born Jews, who had emigrated to the region for a better life, were shot, and up to 5,000 Koreans, descendants of labourers who had arrived in the region during Tsarist times, were deported. The Second World War brought huge changes to the region. Firstly, despite being under 20% of the population in 1938, the horror of the Holocaust sent thousands of Jews fleeing to the region. Unable to leave the Soviet Union and head to Israel or America, many Soviet Jews resigned their faith to the Jewish Autonomous Oblast, a place of safety for the Soviet Jew. By 1948, there were over 40,000 Jews in the region, around 25% of the total population. This too actually brought a softening of Soviet policy towards them, and Jews were allowed to practice their religion, rabbis appearing in the region for the first time since the 1920s. Throughout the 1950s, many Jews who had been sent to the Gulags earlier were rehabilitated and permitted to return to the region. The Jewish Autonomous Oblast did not have a very large population when the war broke out, but nevertheless it did its part. Around 14,000 men and women volunteered for the Red Army, around half returning home. Enormous amounts of foodstuffs, timber and even heavy industry were needed from the region, prompting metallurgy and mineral production plants such as that as Hinganalova to exist. The region was not spared fighting either and was used as a springboard into Manchuria. Thousands of soldiers crossed the Amur into Japanese-occupied Manchuria fighting entrenched Japanese soldiers in a lightning campaign. Yet, despite all of this, 
and the initial interest by the Jewish community, conditions still remained poor, and by 1959, only 14,000 Jews were left in the Jewish Autonomous Oblast. The general stagnation of the 1970s affected the region in a very particular way. Still at risk of flooding and severe weather, one of the worst winters in the region's history struck in 1972, killing thousands of livestock and dozens of people. Poaching and illegal hunting, issues that have blighted the region since Russian colonization began, had ravaged the native Amur tiger population, and the last indigenous tiger was illegally hunted and shot in 1982. This tragedy was met by an outcry from Soviet conservationists, as the Amur tiger had freely roamed around the region dating back to Chinese records. Ironically, a big motivating factor in illegally hunting these tigers was to sell them to the Chinese, who often used parts of the tiger in traditional medicine. It is worth mentioning that this demand has not gone away, and even today, border forces are trying to protect the Amir tigers, who are dwindling further in number. Having never really been a destination that many Jews wanted to go to, there had been building pressure from the 1960s and 70s to allow Soviet Jews to leave. This had been imposed on a number of grounds. Grounds of security, economic grounds, and a general Soviet dislike of letting people leave. And this had led to several high-profile incidents of Soviet Jews trying to leave the Soviet Union. Eventually, these refuseniks, Soviet Jews who had been refused permission to leave for Israel, were finally allowed to go, leading to a further flight from the region in 1987. This left a mere 9,000 Jews in the region, compared to 178,000 Russians. The reasons for emigration were obvious. Low wages, harsh conditions, and a lack of opportunity. But Soviet Jews faced another factor. Discrimination. Despite being in a nominal atheistic society, many Jews were discriminated against, both on grounds of their supposed religion as well as their heritage as non-Slavs in a heavily Slavic region. This only added fuel to the fire. The fact that these Jews were looking to leave for Israel and America, both capitalist nations, also added fuel to this fire, and they were seen as potential traitors or fifth columnists. As the Soviet Union began to falter and stumble, a desperate decision was made in an attempt to find equilibrium. By amending the Soviet Constitution of 1978, a clause was deleted that made autonomous oblasts subordinate to Krais. This meant that the Jewish autonomous oblast was removed from the Habarovsk Krai and made a constituent member of the Russian Soviet Republic. This was an attempt to give the region more autonomy and power within the Soviet Union, a common complaint for many of its constituent parts. What this means is that a region designed to be an autonomous part of a greater region was actually made into its own federal subject. To put this in comparison, it's like your house no longer being a part of your street, but being deemed its own village instead. This actually wasn't that unusual, and four other autonomous oblasts all got elevated to fully-fledged republics, all except the Jewish Autonomous Oblast. So why? Why is the Jewish Autonomous Oblast not a republic? Simple. There both was and is not enough support for it. In 1989, there were just over 9,000 Jews left in the Autonomous Oblast, many with plans to leave at the time. The bulk of the population both was and is Russian. Russians who have no interest in becoming a Jewish Republic within the Russian Federation. That said, there is a bit more to this than meets the eye. In 1993, this was cemented in law under the Russian Constitution making the Jewish Autonomous Oblast a federal subject with a special status. Funds and support from Moscow had been given as a core constituent part of the Russian Federation, and its position on the border with China have made it important enough to warrant significant investment. If the region were to become a republic or to revert its status and become part of another federal subject, as was suggested in 2013, it is very likely that part or most of this funding would disappear. This, for the majority of people, is simply not a valuable trade-off. This investment is important, 
as the Jewish Autonomous Oblast is poor by national standards, agriculture is the largest industry in the region, selling much of its produce to China to the south. This is so important that a new railway bridge, Niznelenskoye Railway, has been built to help improve trade between the two nations. Mining of metals and minerals in the mountains and selling timber are both large industries as well, primarily trading with China to the south. However, an open secret at this point is the sheer scale of the illegal forestry undertaken by the Chinese. Chinese firms are desperate for building materials, and thus much of the deforestation of the autonomous oblast, which in turn can lead to more flooding, is paid for by the Chinese Yuan. These bribes and payoffs actually make an important factor in the local economy, which in turn helps the region fund its factories and infrastructure as the Jewish Autonomous Oblast, much like other poor regions of the Russian Federation, such as Ingushetia, does not have its own power plants for energy production. As mentioned earlier, the population stands at over 150,000 people, significantly lower than the 2010 census. Russians make up the majority at 88%, with the next largest ethnic group being Ukrainians at just under a percent, while Jews make up a tiny half percent. A scattering of other ethnic groups make up the remaining 9.79%. As of the 2012 survey, 39% of the population were Christian, with Russian Orthodoxy as the majority at 23%. Those identifying as spiritual but not religious make up 35%, with atheists at a solid 23%. Both Judaism and Islam make up 1% each, with the remaining 3% being those who gave no answer. The birth rate in the region is low, at 1.67 children per woman. Surprisingly, this is actually higher than the national average, which stands at 1.5. Both the drug abuse and alcoholism rates are higher here than the national average, at 26 incidents per 100,000 and 260 incidents per 100,000 respectively. The governor of the region is Rostislav Goldstein, who has been in power since 2019. He is a Russian Jew, originally from Tver, and is of course a member of the United Russia Party. The Jewish Autonomous Oblast is, without question, one of the more bizarre parts of the Russian Federation. If you were to travel here, some of the sites you might see are the Jewish architecture of Birbijan, some dating back to the 1920s, the Bastak National Reserve, one of the only national reserves where Siberian tigers roam freely, and the mighty Amur River, whose waters boast excellent fishing year-round and tremendous views into China. My name is Andrew, and thank you for watching. Up next is the Kabardino-Balkar Republic. Paka!